Before we get started, let me explain a little bit about the format today. Um, we have our first panel ready to go, and we'll give you an opportunity to make a brief opening statement. Um, we've, you've given us written submissions. Um, I, actually, yours is very long, so I'm not too worried about you reading from it. But um, I do want you to know that we've reviewed those, so you don't need to read uh, from your submissions. Um, after you make your opening statement, then we'll begin questioning by the panel. Let me introduce our first uh, panel participants. We have Chief Judge Catherine Blake from Maryland. We have Magistrate Judge John Feldman from the Western District of New York, and uh, Ms. Kate Clark, Chief from the Defender Services Office. So we'll uh, start with you, Judge Blake, if you'd like to um, make an opening. Thank you very much, uh, Judge Cardone, uh, committee members, friends. My name is Catherine Blake. I'm a former federal prosecutor and magistrate judge, currently the chief judge in the District of Maryland. But I'm here today primarily in my role as chair of the Defender Services Committee, which I'll refer to as DSC. Let me start by thanking all of you for the very challenging task you have undertaken and the, uh, the hard work that you are all devoting to this important study. I'm here with Judge John Feldman, a member of the DSC and chair of our budget subcommittee, and Kate Clark, head of the Defender Services Office in the uh, AO. We do have some opening remarks and then look forward to your questions. I did not submit any narrative testimony, but as the, uh, Judge Cardone mentioned, we did provide a number of background documents on the responsibilities of the Defender Services Committee and the Defender Services Office within the judicial conference structure. And I will not repeat those documents. As you know, the judicial conference is the policy-making body of the federal judiciary. Its members are the chief judges from each circuit and a district judge representative from each circuit. The conference is chaired by the Chief Justice. The conference does much of its work through its committees, one of which is the Defender Services Committee. I have been a member since 2010 and chair since 2012, this being my last year as chair. The DSC members uh, generally include one district or circuit judge from each circuit and a magistrate judge. Also participating in our meetings are a federal defender, presently John Sands from Arizona, a community defender, Reuben Kahn, a member of your panel, uh, and a panel attorney representative, also known as Citizen Chip Friendsley, I gather is not um, here today. Structurally, uh, I believe that the participation of the defenders and the panel attorney in our committee discussions is extremely valuable, indeed essential, to our decision-making process. As you also know, the Defender Services Committee is staffed by the Defender Services Office at the AO, headed by Kate Clark. Kate will tell you more about the work of her office in regard to managing the budget, training, and developing suggested policy guidance. I will just comment that as chair, I work closely with Kate, who joined the office immediately after sequestration and just before the AO reorganization. Despite that bad timing, she has done an outstanding job and presides over a very dedicated and hardworking staff. Our committee has two subcommittees, one for strategic and long-range planning, and one to oversee the budget process for individual defender offices that is chaired by Judge Feldman. My plan is to talk briefly about strategic and long-range planning, then about the overall budget process, and then about some possible changes in the present structure which your committee may be considering. First, as you know, the judiciary engages in long-range planning and recently issued a revised plan in 2015. All committees have a general responsibility to comment on the judiciary's plan within their subject areas. I was pleased institutionally that as chair of DSC, I was invited to be on the ad hoc strategic planning committee that met to discuss the input from all the other committees and help draft the final plan, which is part of the background material we provided. I would just like to point out that the 2015 uh, plan for the judiciary recognizes the goal of providing well-qualified representation to defendants, including, quote, sufficient resources to assure adequate pay, training, and support services. Uh, it also recognizes, quote, where the defendant population and needs of districts differ, guidance and support must be tailored to local conditions. It's part of the long-range plan. In addition, the DSC and DSO have been engaged in their own strategic planning for many years. I think this has been a helpful process. Just to give a couple of concrete examples, the committee, with the assistance of DSO, 
has supported the creation of federal defender or community defender organizations in every district with sufficient caseload. And today there are defender organizations in all but two, the, the districts that meet the caseload requirement. We have supported the creation of case budgeting attorneys at the circuit level, fair compensation for panel attorneys, the creation of capital habeas units, um, affectionately referred to as CHOOSE, in districts with a need for that resource, and of course training programs intended to maintain and improve the quality of representation provided by both defenders and panel attorneys. Of course, the Defender Services Committee, like other conference committees, cannot unilaterally adopt new policy for the judiciary. Rather, we present recommendations to the Judicial Conference, which votes on whether the recommendations should be adopted. One example I can give you re relates to a problem I know you are considering of voucher reductions by judges for other than mathematical or technical errors. Approximately 10 years ago, the DSC proposed and the Judicial Conference adopted as guidelines the principles, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase, that vouchers should not be reduced to save money for the program in bad financial times. And when a court intends to reduce a voucher, counsel should be given prior notice and a chance to respond to the reason for the reduction. Now, the Defender Services Committee has no authority to reverse any specific cut that is made by an individual court or judge, but these policy guidelines provided a basis for me to send out a joint memo with then Director Judge John Bates in December of 2014, reminding courts about these judicial conference policies in, regard, in response to increased reports of unwarranted voucher cutting. Very briefly on the budget process, our committee, with the assistance of DSO, and the guidance of the Budget Committee, develops the proposed budget request to be made to Congress for the following fiscal year. In other words, at our June 2016 meeting, we will agree on an amount that we believe is justified to cover the needs of the defender organizations, the panel attorneys, and program administration for fiscal year 2018. As chair, I meet with the Budget Committee in July of 2016 to present our recommendation. Much of the calculation is driven by caseload and staffing projections, but occasionally there may be areas of disagreement. If our recommendation differs from the Budget Committee, and that difference cannot be resolved between the two committees, the Judicial Conference at its meeting in September will make the final decision. It is also the Budget Committee that presents the Defender Services request, along with the other judiciary requests, to Congress for consideration. And believe that Judge Feldman and Ms. Clark may address in more detail how our budget subcommittee and ultimately the full committee allocates the money that Congress eventually provides. Finally, regarding specific proposals that your committee may be considering, let me offer my personal opinion about some changes that might be made within the present structure. I'm not now speaking officially for the DSC, and I prefer not to offer any opinion on more extensive reforms that might require significant statutory and structural changes, including the relocation of defender services into an independent entity of some kind outside the judiciary. Whatever recommendations this committee makes will be considered, I understand, and commented on after deliberation by the Defender Services Committee next year under a new chair. So, speaking for myself, first, I strongly support the restoration of the Defender Services Office to its prior position of greater autonomy within the AO. I do not question the motivations of the judges and staff responsible for the reorganization. Indeed, I applaud the goals of efficiency and better service to the courts that I assume led to the changes. And I very much appreciate the hard work and commitment that has been shown by AO staff trying to make the new structure succeed. But defenders are not court employees. They are not a program service of the judiciary. They are independent advocates for their clients within our adversary system, and indeed are sometimes adversaries of the court itself. They should be compared in terms of resources, funding, training, and policy to the prosecutors with whom there should be parity. As a corollary to this recommendation, I believe control over the IT staff and computer systems that handle defender data should be returned to DSO and given sufficient dedicated staff and funding. Defenders have legitimate concerns about the confidentiality of their client data, much of which need not and should not be shared with the courts. 
Now, the Defender Services Office and the Defender Services Committee certainly do need access to budget and workload data. But that access should be controlled by a more autonomous DSO working closely with Defender offices. I believe that that transfer would help restore some flexibility and efficiency that has been lost under the reorganization and would also help restore Defender trust in the AO. Again, this is structural and not personal. I do not criticize the dedicated AO staff who have tried hard to make this work. I also support returning to the Defender Services Committee the jurisdiction over compensation and staffing formulas that was transferred to the Judicial Resources Committee. I believe the work measurement process, while well-intentioned and successfully performed thanks to both AO staff and the Defenders themselves, removes needed flexibility from the committee that has the institutional experience and responsibility to support the Defender's unique mission and, for example, respond to changes in prosecution policies or court initiatives in different areas of the country. I support an increase in the panel attorney hourly rate, as many of you already know. I also support a greater role for the committee, DSO staff, defenders, and panel attorneys themselves in advocating to Congress as part of the appropriations process. While I fully understand the need for the judiciary to speak with a consistent voice, and I appreciate the difficult and generally successful work that has been done by the Budget Committee and its staff. I believe there are issues specific to the Defender and Panel Attorney programs on which we could assist and should have the opportunity to be heard. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to answer questions later. Judge Feldman. Thank you, Judge Cardone and committee members. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to testify before the committee. I join all those who have testified before me in thanking you for the time and enormous energy you have and continue to devote to studying the federal system of public defense. Your work is critical to the continued success and improvement of our public defense system. And as I hope you know, the Committee on Defender Services fully supports your efforts. By way of background, I have been a magistrate judge in the Western District of New York for over 20 years. I'm a former federal prosecutor, CJA panel member, and was appointed as the first federal defender for the Western District of New York by the Second Circuit in 1992. I've been a member of the Committee on Defender Services since 2009 and have been chair of the Defender Services Budget Subcommittee, affectionately known as the DSBS, since 2012. There are five other members of our subcommittee, all of whom are judges. In addition to the judge members of our subcommittee, we also have a federal defender representative who participates in all our discussions and deliberations. The focus of my testimony will be to provide to the, your committee information about the role of the Defender Services Budget Subcommittee in three specific areas. First, the budget process for federal defender organizations. Second, the funding of mega cases in defender offices. And third, our initiative with regard to the use of best practices with contracting for private service expert and investigative service providers. I hope also to add a few personal observations about the problems I perceive with respect to the program's current structure. One of the primary responsibilities of the DSBS is to consider and recommend for approval annual budgets for each federal defender organization. Salaries make up approximately 80% of FDO budgets. The cost of space consumes another 10%, and everything else like equipment, furniture, training, library, travel, experts, and supplies make up the last 10%. So as you can tell, the staffing formula is critical to the FDO budget process. Until last year, each defender worked with their assigned budget analyst for the next fiscal year, and then those budgets were reviewed by our committee sometime in August. If there were any special circumstances which impacted the defender office, our subcommittee had the flexibility to adjust an office budget to meet those circumstances and demands, including making staffing adjustments if justified. The work measurement study and the accompanying transfer of jurisdiction over staffing to the Committee on Judicial Resources will, in my view, adversely impact the ability of the DSBS and the full committee to respond to individual FDO office staffing needs that inevitably but predictably arise during, in, excuse me, in a particular defender office. As you know, the defense function is unique and that it only acts in response to prosecutorial initiatives, initiatives that are totally out of its control. While it is perfectly appropriate to use a staffing formula as the starting point for an FDO budget process, restricting the flexibility of a defender organization to adjust staffing needs in response to an unforeseen change in caseload 
whether by virtue of the number of cases, or the complexity of the cases, or sudden changes in the law, places the quality of the representation at risk, in my view. In addition to developing budgets for approval of the full committee, the DSBS also considers and approves funding requests when a defender office has been assigned to a case likely to involve high representation costs. These cases are referred to as mega cases, and although few in overall numbers, consume a disproportionate percentage of the defense appropriation on both defender and CJ sides of the ledger. When a mega case arises, and they most often arise in cases involving a death penalty prosecution, either as a direct representation case or on habeas review, the assigned defender will develop a proposed budget and submit it to the chair of the Defender Services Budget Subcommittee. As chair, and in order to preserve confidentiality even among DSBS members, I assign the case to one of the committee members to act as liaison with the defender. The judge liaison will then contact the defender and work closely with the defender to get the budget ready for presentation to our subcommittee. Once the mega case budget is ready for consideration, our subcommittee will review the proposed budget. Our standard of review is that the defender's litigation plan must reflect the exercise of reasonable and informed professional judgment considered consistent with the best practices of the legal profession and that any requested expert, investigative, or other ancillary professional services are reasonably necessary or appropriate. Our program is, of course, funded with taxpayer dollars, and one of the com committee's strategic goals is to provide cost-effective defense services. In an effort to assist counsel in controlling the cost of private service providers, the DSBS developed, and in December 2013, the committee approved several best practices initiatives for mega cases. These initiatives include requiring written retainer agreements when experts or investigators are hired, setting forth the details of the engagement, including the hourly rate and the approved number of hours. Second, encouraging the use of presumptively reasonable hourly rate ranges for commonly used providers of commonly used private service providers. Three, requiring travel time to be billed at a reduced rate for lengthy periods of travel. And fourth, requiring that federal defenders explore alternatives to an hourly rate of compensation where it's contemplated that a private service provider will be paid more than $100,000 in any 12-month period. The DSBS and the full committee are well aware and troubled by the fact that CGA counsel are not using private service providers and experts with the same frequency as federal defenders. By establishing presumptively reasonable hourly rate ranges for commonly used private service pr providers, and encouraging courts to adopt these policies, we also intended that our new initiatives would be used by panel attorneys to convince presiding judges that private service providers should be used and sought and approved in districts where expert services are underused and to encourage judges to approve a presumptively reasonable hourly rate without question or reduction. All of our best practices initiatives are set forth in a February 2014 memorandum. The memorandum is included in our written submission and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about our best practice initiatives. Finally, like many who have testified before you, I too have views on the overall structure of the federal defense system. And like, like Chief Judge Blake, I have to emphasize that the views I'm going to express are mine only and not those of the DSBS or the full committee. My views are shaped not only by my term as a member of this committee, but also in larger part by my experiences as a CJA attorney and my service as federal defender in the 1990s, at a time when the committee chaired by Judge Prado was reviewing the CJA and we defenders were consumed with discussions and debates about the future structure of our program. In some important ways, the tensions that existed at the time of the Prado report are identical to those that exist today. The first principle of the ABA's 10 principles of a public defense system is independence. That structure or something similar of total independence remains the best, if not only, option to fully embrace the principle of a truly independent public defense delivery system. But another black letter principle of an effective public defense system is that the quality and effectiveness of that system, the ability of the lawyers to meet their Sixth Amendment obligations, is directly dependent on the resources a government is willing to devote to that system of public defense. That was the quandary that caused so much discussion and disagreement among defenders in the early 1990s, and I believe those tensions still exist today. The reason they exist has nothing to do with defenders, or for that matter, judges. It has to do with the one overriding danger perceived to be associated with complete independence, 
the ability to obtain adequate funding for the public defense function. In important ways, the Defender program today is different than the one I was part of 25 years ago. It has grown and matured and established itself as the one of the most respected voices of the principles for the Sixth Amendment. The staff and leadership of the DSO are among the finest people I've ever had a chance to work with. The Defenders today are uniformly individuals at the very top of their profession, experts in the field of federal criminal defense, who for the most part had devoted their careers to defense of the indigent. Putting aside the issue, of whether total separation and independence from the judiciary risks inadequate funding, there remains, in my view, a compelling and immediate need to release control of many of the aspects of the defense function from the control of judges. Indeed, while I consider my service as a member of this committee to be among the most important and rewarding of my judicial career, the fact remains that the direction of the defense function is controlled by a committee made up entirely of judges leaving the nationally recognized experts in the criminal defense profession, the lawyers charged with implementing policies and providing the representations with no vote and little authority over the direction of the defense function. A few moments ago, I testified about the important duties of our budget subcommittee. Frankly, in my opinion, there's nothing the DSBS does that the defenders are not capable of doing themselves and should be doing themselves. The defenders and DSO staff are perfectly capable of using a, flexi a flexible staffing formula to develop office budgets within an established appropriation without judges' involvement. As far as mega cases go, defenders have the experience and expertise most judges don't have in deciding whether a particular litigation plan is consistent with the best practices of the legal profession and whether a particular private expert or investigator is reasonably necessary or appropriate. In fact, their advocacy in convincing many members of my committee that a particular type of expert is truly needed or that a particular line of investigation is necessary has been remarkable and persuasive, but I often wonder whether this is a hoop that they should really be required to jump through. My point is that even with the limitations inherent in having the defense function placed within the judicial branch, more must be done to establish greater autonomy and independence. The current structure requires the voice of defenders to be filtered through the judges. That filter, in many respects, is unnecessary and, more importantly, deprives the defense community of their best advocates on policy and funding issues of national importance. If it's determined that the best option for ensuring adequate funding for the defense function is to maintain the defender and panel program within the judiciary, then my view is, to the extent possible, control of the defense services must not rely solely or even predominantly on judges. I close with saying whether increased autonomy and independence is delivered by establishing some new national governing body within the judiciary or by revamping the existing Defender Services Committee structure to, evolve, to involve and allow for voting membership of FDO, CDO, and CGA panel members or by some other mechanism is one of the many challenges you face. If there are easy answers to these structural tensions, they escape me, but I thank you for the opportunity to be heard and I'll try my best to answer any questions you may have. Ms. Clark. Good afternoon, Judge Cardone, committee members and staff. As others have said, thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to testify, but also for your time, hard work, and dedication to this historic study. My name is Kate Clark, and I am the Chief of Defender Services Office in the Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts. Only a few blocks from here, I used to volunteer as his tutor in a small public school when I was an undergraduate at Villanova University. And yes, this is not in my remarks, but I have to note, not only do they have a wonderful basketball team and are <laughs> national champions, uh, but I uh, want you to know that the university also instilled in its students a, a moment and a, a, an, em an emphasis on public service and community service. And to that end, I would go every week to a small neighborhood in Philadelphia and tutor young men and women. In the mid-1980s, that neighborhood where I tutored, law enforcement dropped bombs on row houses during a standoff. It started a fire that killed 11 people. Five of them were children. It destroyed 61 homes and displaced 250 people. And the fire burned for almost an hour, and neighborhood, the neighborhood was left in ashes. This was a very formative moment in my life and my legal career. I knew that the promise of America lay not in violence and hatred, 
but in a commitment to equal justice under law and giving voice to the voiceless or disaffected or disenfranchised. Today, I am honored to serve as the leader of America's federal public defense program, which is at its very core dedicated to equal justice for all. The scope of this committee's review <coughs> includes an assessment of support provided by DSO to federal defender organizations and CJA panel attorneys across this nation. DSO office staff is committed to supporting and building the highest quality hybrid public defender system in the federal courts. A hybrid system requires us to become proficient on an array of laws, policies, internal judiciary procedures, and external political dynamics so that both the panel and the federal defender programs can provide a zealous defense in every single case. We must meet the needs of all clients. We at DSO work to support this program, but primarily I want you to know we are focused on the Sixth Amendment. And to that end, I wanted to just share with you and the committee the work that we do, but start with an overarching the principles by which I lead the office and we manage the national federal defense program. I think it's important that you know what our office culture is like and what we do, how we hire and focus on this right. At the outset, we always ask questions about the Sixth Amendment. It is critical to recognize why we have a Defender Services program at all. The spirit of fair representation requires acts of dissent and a commitment to equal justice under law. Our American history is not to just tolerate a zealous defense, but encourage it. Why is the right to counsel in criminal cases recognized in the Constitution, affirmed by the Supreme Court, and supported by both congressional authorizers and appropriators? If you ask anyone on our staff in the Defender Services Office why we do what we do, they'll probably be able to cite three fundamental reasons. First, the basic value of the American legal system proudly engraved on the pediment of the United States Supreme Court building is equal justice under law. And therefore, the Defender Services Program works to make sure that this commitment is kept that our system of justice lives up to its noble ideals regardless of financial means of the accused. A second fundamental reason for a strong defense function is to hold the government accountable. Through the quality of its legal advocacy and adversarial hearing testing of the prosecution, the program helps assure adherence to the Constitution in all criminal cases on a daily basis. Thirdly, the National Defender Program helps sustain public confidence in the administration of justice by demonstrating a firm commitment to fairness, due process, and the rule of law. In other words, our job is to support those who protect individuals inside the criminal justice system because public defenders, federal defenders, community defenders, panel attorneys bring individual voices and their circumstances forth to ensure fairness and the rule of law. We're all connected. We all have a part in ensuring the rule of law is protected, not overcome by hatred or bombs or over-incarceration or marches in the streets. This independent role is critical in an adversarial criminal justice system. In service to these goals, my office, Defender Services office staff, dedicate themselves to this mission we ensure that every accused person is provided representation consistent with the highest standards of the legal profession. So briefly, let me tell you how we do that. I will share three examples after I explain our organization so everyone understands how the Defender Services Office is structured, and then take questions. DSO is a component of the AO's Department of Program Services. And, it re and I report and our staff reports the associate director of that department. DSO 
is organized into four divisions, all connected to providing critical support to the attorneys and staff in the field. First, our Program Operations Division, what we also call POD, has four main functional areas. As you heard from Judge Feldman, budget is critical. Yes, the POD budget staff formulates and justifies the program's annual budget request, and it is responsible for executing the enacted appropriation. In fiscal year 2016, our budget totaled $1.1 billion, and we support more than 3,500 FDO personnel and more than 10,000 panel attorneys. Budget execution includes activities such as developing budgets for each FDO, tracking and projecting spending and caseloads, creating budget reports for management and preparing grant disbursements for the community defender offices. Our program operations division members, staff, provide daily support to FDO personnel for local matters that include supplemental funding needed for flexibility, help interpreting the staff formulas, implementing the formulas, mega case budgeting, and establishing capital habeas units. The second is the assessment. The Pro Program Operations Division provides team reviews, consult consultations on in the field, reports on operations and administration of the Federal Defender Services Program in each federal judicial district in order to ensure that it is administered in accordance with applicable statutes, judicial conference policies, and policies or practices of the Judicial Conferences Committee on Defender Services. The assessments also help us ensure that FDO administrative and operational processes are implemented correctly. We help offices from everything from HR programs, pr problems, audits, to union negotiations. And when needed, we send staff in to help whenever necessary. Operations. The operations function area provides FDOs with non-budget services related to their unique operational needs, such as human resources. POD, for example, maintains and updates the pay tables every year. We try to ensure parity with the U.S. attorneys, and as you probably have heard, the U.S. attorneys' uh, uh, pay scale has been adjusted, and we were working on that currently to adjust the pay scales in our offices. We work on space and facilities. Not an easy task, actually, as some of you may know. Uh, procurement, training. We train staff in, at the ADO conference, the, assist, the Administrative Officers Conference, and we also help with new defenders and ADO orientations. Travel policies, they can be quite complex. We track appointments of defenders. This is a service to the circuit courts as well. And we also support information technology. Other activities under operations include maintaining the case waiting systems, our system of record for the case waits, as you heard from Judge Blake, and we coordinate the management of data collection systems. And administratively, the POD division also functions in a way that uh, addresses DSO issues and AO issues common to all other divisions. But this includes management issues, uh, DSO's contributions, for example, to GAO reviews. As you know, the Government Accounting Office will call for a study, and so we support that work to make sure accurate information is relayed to the GAO. And in any financial audits, we're very active in ensuring the judiciary meets all of their audit requirements. The Legal Policy Division is the second division DSO's second division is, serves primarily to support the Defender Services Committee, which you have just heard about. Judge Blake and Judge Feldman and other members of the committee are incredibly dedicated and active. And I just want to take a moment to thank them. It has been a true honor to work with this committee during a very challenging time. We work with the committee to coordinate the briefing materials and 
We also ensure that all of its subcommittees have accurate data and materials to prepare for their decision making. At the direction of the Defender Services Committee, with the assistance of a professional research firm, our legal and policy division staff develops, administers, and analyzes national programmatic surveys of federal, defend of federal judges, panel attorneys, panel attorney district representatives, which we like to call our padres, and the chief federal defenders. These surveys are not just your normal surveys. They provide critical data and programmatic performance over time, over lengths of time, to help set our priorities for improving the program and initiatives. Data and stories are critical to the success of the Defender Services Program. The Legal Policy Division organizes annual conferences for chief federal defenders and the 94 Padres, our panel attorney district representatives, and we coordinate contracts for national positions and services, a very important part of our job. Finally, the Legal Policy Division staff provides guidance on CJA and judicial conference policies on a variety of issues, including panel attorney compensation and reimbursement. The use of experts and service providers. I know that has been a very important issue for all of you. District and circuit CJA plans. Disclosure of CJA information to the public. When we receive public requests, we ensure that they have accurate and up-to-date information. Litigation involving FDOs. We support those offices that are sometimes sued. International prisoner transfers and international case-related travel. That's the Legal Policy Division. The third division, you have also heard a bit about, but I want to make sure you understand what the Defender Services Office uh, does in terms of our training division. The training division develops and administers a variety of extremely high quality national, regional, and local training events for both FDOs and CJA panel attorneys. Among these programs are the Fundamentals of Federal Criminal Defense Seminar, targeted at practitioners newer to the federal system. The Trial Skills Academy provides on hands, on, hands on, excuse me, trial skills and many other events, including in 2015, we held a seminar on race in the federal criminal justice system. Each year, our training division supports and sponsors close to 40 national programs. We broadcast a number of webinars and support hundreds of local and regional trainings developed by federal defender offices. They also maintain FD.org, which contains an array of resources for CJA attorneys as well as links to upcoming and prior training events with an archive of materials. Frankly, it's one of the best training divisions in the country. We can also do more. We can reach more people if we had more resources. Our final division, which is administrative, provides critical support for the administration of centrally held funds. The delivery of equipment, materials, and other logistics for national training and management seminars. We provide record keeping and accounting services. Our administrative division, which uh, as you all know, are very hardworking, but also very critical to keeping not only the trains moving, but tro <laughs> trolley cars and subways. They make all of this happen, and I want to thank them because oftentimes they go unnoticed. Through the combination of these activities and many others, which time prevents me from relating, DSO is constantly working to strengthen this right to counsel in the federal courts. As you've heard, there are areas of concern we are working on these areas. Some of those areas, if I may highlight, take a moment to highlight, are optimizing the program structure to best support its goals and needs. We are working to support capital habeas units, improve data collection. We must try to ensure the availability of needed human resources with expertise. I'm a believer in leadership training and management, and as the book Good to Great speaks about, you have to get the right people on the bus, but get them in the right seats. And that's what we're working to do, is get sh make sure we have the right people inside DSO with the right skill set to ensure that we can provide the highest quality support. 
We also know we have a ways to go with achieving the appropriate level of parity with the Department of Justice. It's not just pay parity. It's training. It's celebrating and improving our detail program on Capitol Hill and other places. We also must address unwarded voucher reduc reductions and the denial of underuse of experts and other service providers. All strong leaders know you need to identify and build upon your assets and then address these problems. We do have assets. We must acknowledge the Defender Services Office has many assets that are growing and we appreciate the support of the Defender Services Committee, the Judicial Conference, but also the work that you have noted that is working well. Let me just identify three and conclude. The first is our Padre program. The Panel Attorney District Representative Program deserves special mention because most panel attorneys are solo or small firm practitioners. Through the Padre Program, we have dramatically increased the effectiveness of the panel attorney component of the program. We have aligned their efforts with national objectives and fostered an institutional presence in every district. And now when we do our assessments, for example, we work with the Federal Defender or Community Office, but we also reach out to the panel. Our panel program is very important in this hybrid criminal justice system. The second example of an asset that I would like to note is our case budgeting attorney program. Our legal and policy staff have been instrumental in developing and expanding the case budgeting attorney program to 10 of the 12 circuits. DSO provides funding and training for these case budgeting attorneys who act as trusted intermediaries between the courts and the panel attorneys. And they help ensure that complex cases receive needed resources while remaining cost effective. Finally, our training division administers the National Litigation Support Program. You have heard from Mr. Broderick, and I just want to note it is an asset. Our national programs are a great asset to the Defender Services Organization and the Defender Program. Our National Litigation Support Program in particular provides critical resources and training for their, the ever-growing number of cases involving high-volume, complex electronic discovery. In addition to expert national resource staff hosted by the FDO in Oakland, we have developed a joint e-discovery protocol with the Department of Justice and contracted with three coordinating discovery attorneys to actively manage exceptionally voluminous or complex discovery issues. We benefit, all of us again are connected, and we benefit from communications and meetings with those in the Department of Justice, such as our death penalty protocols and our work with the Access to Justice Office. My remarks here only cover a sample of the work performed daily by the men and women of the Defender Services Office. Typically, they work with little fanfare and recognition. I look forward to your questions to discuss these and other issues in more detail. Thank you. All right, let's begin with questions, and we'll start with you, uh, Judge Fisher. Well, we could spend all three days <laughs> with the three of you, I think, and thank you for being here. Ms. Clark, I'd like to uh, start with you, and, and the judges may have comments uh, on this as well. Uh, you've given us testimony. You've given us this information about uh, a little bit about how the process works. And the bad news for me was that it was so fascinating, because it seems like that should be things that I should have known before. And I've, uh, I've contacted the uh, DSO on a regular basis and, and called for information on particular cases or particular uh, billing issues, that kind of thing. I don't think very many judges in the country know that that's an asset that we have. And I would not have known it but for the fact, as you know, that we have uh, a staff person, a CJA supervising attorney. And it was she who said to me, well, you know, why don't we call DSO and, and see what they, 
what information they have on this issue. So it's a tremendous asset that I think most judges don't know about. In addition, uh, and here's my question, par much of the time I get an answer, but the answer will be, oh, Judge Fisher, you always call us with such interesting questions, and this is a gray area. What, there, there must be a lot of gray areas that you know about that it would be helpful for us to have an answer for so that what's happening around the country could be more consistent. One particular thing is how do we tell if a case is extended or complex? And I know there's a little bit of information in the guide and there's certain things that are addressed in the guide. You can't, you can't pay for clerical, for example. There's, there's, what would the process be to get us more information? Do, it, I, I assume you can't just decide, yes, we'll start paying for this. What would the process be, um, assuming it all stays in the judiciary and, and DSO still performs the functions that it performs, we're still going to need help. And how can we figure out how to get you more help so you can get us more help? Okay. So um, if I might, I'll start with the overarching uh, message, which is uh, you're absolutely right that we need to let more judges know about the Defender Services Office, but also educate them about the defense function. And so I'm hoping to that end, we would have more opportunities to work with the FJC on training judges uh, and providing really thorough uh, training about not just what the Defender Services Office can do for them, but how we operate within judicial conference policy. Because I think that's where we get into the gray area that you might be referring to. I see you shaking your head. And which right. is yeah. where we, because we work within the judicial conference policies, we can't often answer directly. We have to, of course, check the guide, of course, make sure that we're operating within the appropriate uh, boundaries. And um, I think you heard Mr. Kalar say in his earlier testimony, we need a buck stops here mentality. Um, to a certain extent, we do do that, but in other ways, we can't. Uh, structurally, we can't because of, of, of the work in our, in our structure. I do want to note, though, that um, we train, we try to make sure that all new judges, chief judges in particular, we go to every single orientation and we bring this information to them. And we're always offering our direct lines, our emails, and we have duty day attorneys in several of our divisions who answer questions all the time. Once people figure out that we have a wealth of resources or that we can find the right people, uh, we try very hard to make sure we answer promptly and we, we do um, educate on those cases and the complicated cases. That chief judge information is not necessarily getting beyond that chief judge. Right. <laughs> so, which is, uh, which was my second point, which is I, um, if I could share a funny story, which was when I first took this job, um, I had several friends in the world that I worked in and, uh, and they went online and they said, well, congratulations, you're head of the training division. And I said, no. And they said, well, they said, well, we went to FD.org and we couldn't find anything on the judiciary's, uh, at that point, now it's changed, but at that point they couldn't find anything about what our office did. And it was an education to folks, uh, my friends in the Constitution Project, NLADA, NACDL, people who work in this field didn't know much about the internal operations and the assets which we could offer. So that's one of my goals, is communications and, and, and ensuring that we have greater um, presence that filters beyond the chief judge orientations with the FJC and with the help of our Office of Public Affairs, who has also been very helpful in trying to raise our presence. But I thought maybe, would you like to speak about the, what cases qualify, at least for DSBS? And sure. Uh, the Mega case is, is defined as, as a case in which you can reasonably expect it'll take over 300 hours to complete. Which is almost everything in our district. It would and be many others, everything. I'm sure. Right. And yet I would bet that very, very few magistrate judges or district judges are re recommending case budgeting in things that are mega cases. Absolutely. And the difficulty is, and you've identified it, is it's very difficult to get judges to read memos that come out or be educated on things. I mean. The case initiatives that I talked about, it went out in a February 14th memo, but uh, I remember reading um, 
Kathy Williams' testimony, when she gets an, a memo from the AO, she automatically goes to the <laughs> delete button. So it's really, really hard to get that information out there. And, you know, you all know about it, and the people on the Defender Services Committee knows about it, but you're absolutely right. Getting that information out there and the resources that are available is very, very difficult. Sure. Uh, I could like to add a few things. Um, in terms of the extended and complex, a lot of that, I think, right now is simply defined by hours and, and dollars. Uh, and that is useful to some extent. Uh, I personally think that the current case compensation maximum is a bit lower than it should be. I think there are many cases that require more than um, that amount that would not necessarily be considered extended and complex, would just be the normal kind mm -hmm. of cases um, that we see. But uh, going back to training, I would echo what Ms. Clark said about the Federal Judicial Center and its ability not just to reach chief judges, uh, I agree with you, but the baby judge training, for example, uh, the periodically, the educational workshops that we do have from time to time, I would, would welcome, and they're certainly doing it, but I would welcome even greater involvement from the FJC. Uh, we can, in some ways, disseminate guidelines through things like CJA model plans. I think we're working on an update of that now. Um, we can, I think, having local CJA committees that involve the defenders and the panel attorneys who may know some of what the uh, AO does, even if the, if the judges don't. And then it becomes important with an initiative such as e-voucher, which we haven't talked about in any specifics, but one of the important things, um, I think, for us and for our committee in the development of e-voucher is that it should conform to judicial conference policies. For example, requiring a reason when there is a reduction. It is an electronic system that people want to be as easy as possible, but we think it's important that it build in these guidelines that not everyone may be familiar with. Or, or choose to follow if they or are choose familiar. to follow. And I guess that's the problem with dealing with Article Three judges. <laughs> a guideline is a guideline. <laughs> Let me just ask also if you have comments on, and I'm not sh quite sure how to put this, but whether there's a tension or how you deal with the tension between your very specific function with regard to the defense, but being within an organization that has as its mission, or as one of its missions at least, serving the judiciary. And I think that may have been part of what resulted in the defense function coming <laughs> under that. Go ahead, Ms. Clark. <laughs> Did you notice Judge it. Blake said, go ahead, Kate. <laughs> um, <coughs> Yes, uh, without a doubt, but I think um, that also I want to note that we are protected in many ways by uh, the judiciary and, and, uh, and I think there are many judges and staff who, who ensure that the defense function is uh, well run, efficient, and serves, is client-centered. We are a very, as you could hear from my testimony, a uh, client-centered, mission-driven organization. Um, there are times in that client-centered, mission-driven decision-making where a new initiative might come from the Hill and the judicial conference policy dictates how, what we do, and it might be focused on, well, that's awfully costly, or it's a lot of time for the courts, or if we do this, it will be a lot of money. Um, I'm thinking of immigration, I'm thinking of uh, some of the work on um, Johnson, drugs minus two, et cetera, you all know, as you're shaking your heads as well. Um, that can be very challenging in that we will put forth our ideas, but again, it, they're not always consistent with judicial conference policy, so our writing will sometimes um, end, on, end on the floor of the cutting room uh, as the statements go forth, and that's, that's where we are, but we also make sure that we educate and continue to train and work in other ways. Um, the judicial conference policies uh, are, are really what guide our legal policy division and our office, and, and that is what often happens, the conversations I have with the legal um, policy folks within the judiciary. I will say things like, can we start an initiative on, let's, let's say, compassionate release? Mm -hmm. Let's make sure we, we help people uh, with compassionate release. And um, I'll 
talk with Matt Rollin, my colleague in the Department of Program Services, and Laura Miners in support of it. But there, um, there are definitely boundaries by which we could do this work. And so sometimes I, I dream of being able to um, be a little more proactive in certain areas. Not a little more, very proactive in those areas. Uh, but structurally, that's, that's not appropriate. Thank you. Yeah. I'd just, just add that I, I think Ms. Clark does a, a very good job of walking a tightrope, but she is institutionally put in that position because obviously she is right now part of the judiciary. Um, her focus is on staffing our committee and on absolutely responding to the people that direct her work in the administrative office at the same time uh, trying to maintain and support the uh, the mission of the defender. So it's, it's a difficult role when I think she balances very well, but there are conflicts. Judge Walt. Uh, we, we have received conflicting views about whether it would be advisable for us to recommend that there be a separate entity uh, providing the services that Defender Services provides. And one of the concerns is whether uh, you would be able to get the funding that you now get, which I know is not adequate, but it's what it is. What are your feelings about whether you would be able to get what you need maybe to the level that you get now and maybe even more if you were separate as compared to being under the cover of the judiciary? I'll, I'll start. Um, I don't feel comfortable giving you a final opinion though. I mean, I recognize this is a very critical issue. I think that uh, we have done reasonably well with Congress. In fact, I think the lesson of sequestration, which was a horrendous ax, but it hit everybody. I don't believe it was specifically aimed at defenders. Uh, what Part of what we learned from that, I think, is that Congress was actually fairly responsive, that understood those needs. In fact, defenders got one of the two, I think it was, anomalies or special additional amounts of money to help out during that crisis. So I think there are is some good advocacy that can be done uh, for the defense function, whether it is inside or outside the judiciary. Um, I also worry a little bit, however, that uh, wanting to go outside the judiciary may be too much of a reaction to what did happen over the past few years. Sequestration, I hope, was unusual. It had not happened before in my um, uh, memory, that, that degree of a, of a cut uh, by Congress. And there are examples um, also of nonprofit agencies, of institutions outside the judiciary um, losing the favor of Congress and being cut. I think the judiciary, while we may not have done a perfect job all the way along, uh, really does understand the importance of the defense function and that uh, all of us, and I include the Budget Committee and the Executive Committee, uh, well, we may have disagreements, really do want to secure adequate funding uh, for the defense function along with the rest of the judiciary. So there is some protection in that placement. I agree. I, you know, I, I just remember back in the 90s this discussion, and uh, it, it pretty much is the same discussion. I, I, should it be absolutely independent and separate? Yes, if you're looking at what the perfect is. Um, but I worry that um, the only branch of government which has a understanding of the importance of the Sixth Amendment and would defend that against other branches and against the power of the purse is the judiciary. I mean, this is a, an organization where the highest calling is representing the Lofners and the Kaczynskis and the Sarnoffs, and it would take, I think, very easily for uh, the other branches of government to, to really use that against uh, the defense function. Um, and I, I think the only branch that can adequately defend it is the judiciary. That being said, I think there has to be a lot of changes in terms of giving more autonomy and independence to, uh, uh, to defenders and, uh, and the whole organization. But that's my view. It's not the view of the committee. I'm just speaking on my own behalf. As was I. Um, I would agree uh, with what was said. I would also just add that the Budget Committee and over the years, if you've seen, the program has grown. We now have 81 offices and we serve 10,000 panel to 14,000 panel attorneys. Um, that support has uh, grown over time. I think sequestration certainly highlighted a lot of challenges uh, and 
we, what we have to think about is that relationships on the Hill are critical. And it's not just a parachuting in relationship once in a while. The financial liaison office has excellent relationships with the subcommittee members and staff. Um, we have made headway. Judge Blake and I just recently were invited with Diana Simpson and uh, Ed O'Kane, who run the financial liaison office, to go over to the Hill. And it really, um, it really was a moment that made me very proud because we connected with the staff members and it reminded me of my days when I used to do work on the Hill uh, for other organizations about explaining the work and ensuring that you had, we had survey data, but we also could answer questions and tell stories. And that ongoing relationship is very critical when Congress is deciding on our budget, but also on new initiatives or legislation like sentencing. But those relationships have to be built over time. And I think that's an, an important note that the financial liaison office has that they've done a very good job. I think we could do a better job with them or alongside or more proactive. That's my personal view, just because I do feel comfortable speaking to people on the Hill about the importance of this work and parity. Remember, the prosecutors have a number of details on the Hill. And they influence not only policy, but budgets, et cetera. And so I think we could improve our, our voice uh, in the budget process, and we are making headway. And I want to say thank you to the Budget Committee and thank you to the financial liaison staff who have helped us. But I think we still have work to do. And does the current structure inhibit your ability to establish those relationships? Yes. I, I, we work through the financial liaison office. If you were elevated to the prior structure that you have within the AO, would that address that concern? We would still work through the financial liaison office, but I think the FJC, well, Judge Blake, you are, and both of you are active in the FJC. I think they, though, prepare their budget, and the financial liaison office also takes it to the Hill. I, that, I believe that's correct. The Federal Judicial Center develops its own budget independent of uh, the rest of the judicial conference uh, structure, but uh, has chosen to have the advocacy of the budget committee on behalf of the Federal Judicial Center to actually present that budget um, to Congress. Do they fiddle with the budget at all? Or do they just, is it a pass-through? I believe it is a pass-through. Oh. The budget committee does, does not, so far as I know, um, influence the particular parameters, although they may very well consult on what is the general fiscal climate but I, I don't want to be taken as an expert on, on that part, piece of it. Uh, budget cutting is something that we, I mean, uh, 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 voucher cutting is something that we have um, heard in virtually every uh, hearing that we've had. Fortunately, we don't seem to have a big problem in that regard in my district, I think to a large degree because of A.J. Kramer, uh, but it is apparently a problem in other uh, districts. If the structure cannot be changed, and I think that would be a major obstacle, I think, getting that changed through Congress. But assuming we have to maintain the current structure, is there something that we could recommend be done in order to address that problem? I mean, because as indicated, sometimes, I hate to say it, the robe causes us to sometimes not be appreciative of the needs of others and we don't listen. Uh, to what we're being told, and we do things uh, on our own lark, and it works to the detriment of others. Uh, and unless we're mandated to do things, sometimes we won't do it. Is there any way we could change the culture to cause judges to be appreciative that cutting is, in fact, adversely impacting the ability of people to get the representation they're entitled to? I, we have. Um, they're a combination of answers, yeah. um, uh, one of which certainly is education. Um, and I mentioned, uh, I mentioned in fact, uh, the fact that we could send out a memo, which I understand may or may not be read, but that we have judicial conference guidelines to support our position about voucher reduction. Um, there are things like, again, model CJA plans, local CJA committees, and strengthening them. I think there is also um, and I'll just mention briefly with my Maryland hat on, uh, we have a position 
uh, which we call a CJA coordinating attorney. It is somewhat like the case budgeting attorneys on the circuit level, and I do think case budgeting attorneys are, are a helpful way to address, or can be, uh, the issue of voucher reduction. But within the District of Maryland, um, we have a, uh, a professional employee, a former defense attorney, who is responsible initially for the substantive review of all the vouchers. It is not perfect. It has gone a long way to bring some consistency to what would otherwise be 10 or 15 different district judges who all may take slightly different approaches to the idea of reviewing vouchers. There is still some supervision by a magistrate judge, and of course, again, it's a fairly low case compensation maximum, and anything over that has to go to the circuit. But the involvement of case budgeting attorneys, a supervising attorney, um, for the districts where the uh, federal defenders are willing, um, if the federal defender were more responsible for the voucher panel management and voucher review. I think there's a lot to be said for that. I think one would have to get around um, the genuine concern about conflict, but if the federal defender, for example, is not reviewing the voucher him or herself, but is supervising the trained professional, uh, and then there were some, perhaps some sort of review system, I think, Judge Feldman might speak to this. I think there are some districts where there, if there is a difference about a voucher that cannot be resolved, panel attorneys and the defender are involved in mediating uh, that dispute and giving the panel attorney a voice to explain why that voucher should not be reduced. Yeah, I would say two things. One, I think you have to have whatever system you have, you have to have some due process built into it. I think it just can't be, I'm cutting your voucher. And from what I understand, that's the situation in some districts. I'm not a big proponent of having the federal defender do voucher reviews. I think there's an inherent conflict there that maybe could be uh, resolved by having the federal defender have somebody independent of their office, not independent, but within their office, but not answering to them doing the initial voucher review. In our district, our CJA plan has a committee made up of um, two magistrate judges, uh, four panel attorneys, two from each of the cities, and our federal defender, Mary Mariano, who's going to testify here tomorrow. Um, and when a judge has a problem with a voucher, the judge will refer it to the committee. The members of the committee, except for the judicial members, we don't get involved. The, the attorney members go out and actually do an investigation, interview the uh, attorney involved, talk to the judge, find out what the problems are, um, and then write a written recommendation to the presiding judge as to whether the voucher is fair and reasonable or whether cuts should be made, and if cuts should be made, what the suggested cuts are. In all the years we've been doing this, um, I think there has not been a situation where the presiding judge, after getting the recommendation of the committee, has not adopted that recommendation. And that recommendation has always not been to uh, approve the voucher as written. That recommendation has sometimes uh, recommended substantial cuts in the voucher because uh, based on the uh, committee's review, they felt the voucher was, was not appropriate. In several circuits, we've heard that the problem exists at the circuit level review. Is there any good reason for the circuit to be involved in that review process? That's way above my pay grade, but uh, <laughs> my answer is no. Yeah. It's difficult for me to think of one. Same. Thank you. Dr. Rucker. Thank you, Judge Cardone. Uh, I'd like to ask a, a, a series of questions, if I may, and a lot of it's going to resolve around money. Uh, <laughs> We talked about the $1.1 billion budget. One of the things, uh, Chief Judge Blake, that you mentioned in your opening comments is you thought the hourly rate was too low. What should it be? Well, at least we should go to the statutorily authorized maximum, which I believe this year would be $146 per hour for non-capital cases. Some will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we should at least go to that rate. I have not set my sights higher because we have not yet been able to get to the statutorily authorized maximum, but that's what I would support. Well, let me follow up with that. I, I know we haven't gotten there, and that's one of the reasons <laughs> I asked that. But as we've gone around the country, we've heard repeatedly that the rate is not high enough, and people have suggested it should be significantly higher than mm -hmm. 144, 146, 150. They've gone much higher than that. What, should we do it regionally? Uh, should there be regional variations like we do with staff? Um, 
That is an issue that I think the DSO and, and, and our committee has looked at from time to time. I think it's worth looking at it. Uh, I'm not yet persuaded that that would make a significant difference in the availability of qualified counsel. Um, sometimes what I have heard, contrary to the thought that, well, perhaps you just need to raise the rate in the areas where the cost of living is higher, that is not necessarily true. There may be rural areas where there's simply just not a supply uh, of qualified counsel uh, or there are geographical challenges that mean you have to offer them more money if you if you really want to have them there. I mean, in terms of the, the amount, I one could look at the fact that DOJ, I believe, pays at least $200 an hour uh, when it uh, appoints um, counsel to, uh, to, to represent folks. Uh, we certainly pay more than that um, for civil rights work and so forth, but uh, maybe the $200 an hour the DOJ pays would be a good number to look at. As I say, I have not gone beyond focusing on getting us to the statutory maximum at this point. Judge Feldman, would you like to comment? Uh, I can tell you that I think whatever you do, you have to consider that most CGA counsel are not in big law firms. They're in smaller firms, sometimes solo practitioners. I think you have to figure out what the overhead costs would be and then work off of that. I think at the rates they currently are, I think the overhead is, is basically eating up a great deal of the, uh, of the hourly rate that's being paid. I think you do need to have geographical differences because I think um, that's just a fact of life that it costs more in New York City to, to get a lawyer than it would in other areas uh, of the country. Maybe you could have ranges that a court could adopt. But yeah, I do think that uh, CJA counsel are definitely underpaid at the current rate and it's very frustrating I think to the committee that we're unable to get even the statutory rate approved and that we've been given advice where well, you shouldn't go for it all this year, you should go for it over two or three years. Um, it's very, very frustrating to our committee to, to have to do that um, when it's, uh, it's, it's deficient as it is even right now. I would just add when uh, Judge Feldman says it's frustrating, I was and have been for the past three years surprised at the amount of time we spend trying to reach the statutorily authorized rate. And so, uh, yes, we do need to raise the rate, but I also think that looking to the prosecution and what they pay uh, their attorneys as well as their experts is an important, again, notion of parity. And in an adversarial justice system, I think that's what we should be looking to. Let me stay with this economic theme, if I may. One of the things that we've uh, seen uh, looking at the data is there's uh, a shockingly low rate of the use of experts and service providers. Uh, and if we really were to use them at the rate that some people have suggested we should be and pay the rates that we should be paying, because there's been a lot of concern about the rates that they've been paid as well, it's going to cause an increase in the amount of money requested by the people. How do we get people to do more? Is it a training issue? And let me follow up with that, and I'd like to hear from all three of you about this. Uh, we have talked about training, and that is one of the focal points of, of our committee is to look at the training and the quality of training. What we've heard is the quality of training has been very good, both by DSO and also by the local defenders. But what we've also heard is that there's not enough of it, and that most of the panel members in particular are not getting the training that they need, and it's even more complicated for them because they have to pay for the training and they can't bill for the training. So is there a solution for that as well? And if there is, it would seem to me that's going to need for us to increase the request for money as well. So I know that's a complicated set of questions, so let me start, if I may, with Chief Judge Blake. Uh, sure. Going back to the part about the, in, in some instances, low, apparent low use of rate, uh, rate of use, excuse me, of investigative and experts. I think there are a couple answers. One, I do think it's training, and um, I would add training of judges, not just training of panel attorneys. It's a matter of uh, court culture and, and what people um, expect. Uh, I would point out that the increase in use of experts, and we're, when we say expert, this includes simply investigators, paralegals, that right. sort of place. It may be that some of that work can cost less to the federal government ultimately if what is happening now, at least in some instances, is that the panel attorney is doing that work him or herself and by employing a paralegal or an investigator, they could do it more efficiently. So 
certainly there may be some increase in cost, but it is not completely in that uh, dollar for dollar, let's say. Um, in regard to training, I do think there could well be an increase in the amount of training that is provided, uh, particularly to reach the panel attorneys, uh, as you've mentioned. Reflecting again on parity and the prosecution, we all hear about the National Advocacy Center that uh, DOJ has as, as a resource. Uh, they spend a great deal more amount of money, I believe, on, on training uh, than, uh, than, than we do. So whether one national center is the answer, I'm not prepared to say at this point, but um, better financing and more extensive use of training and perhaps um, to some degree being able to provide that without putting, passing the cost along to the local panel attorneys, I think would be very welcome. I agree with Judge Blake. I, I think there's, it's a two-headed monster. You have CJ lawyers not asking for experts, and you have judges not approving experts or not seeing the need for experts. Um, I think training is essential. When I leave here, I'm going to Charleston for a Magistrate Judge Conference, and we're putting on a, a training on best practices for CJA panels and panel management. That's one of the things we're talking about to judges is the need to approve experts and, uh, and hopefully get them uh, more uh, more up to speed on that. I also think the current statute provides that I think it, I should know this, but I think it's $800. You can get $800 worth of investigative without going to the judge first. That's a ridiculously low amount. That needs to be raised uh, considerably, just as the uh, as the statutory maximum needs to be raised from 10,000. I think at least doubled. I think uh, to get an ex to get an investigator to do work for $800 uh, on, a, on a complicated case or even a not so complicated that 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 rate is ridiculously low, and I think that would be one of the recommendations I would make to your committee is you've got to raise you've got to raise that rate. You know, on the judge's side, uh, you know, you know much better than I do what some judges' attitudes are towards experts, and I think this best practices initiatives that we've put out there, we're hoping, you know, we called them commonly used experts, presumptively reasonable rates for commonly used experts. The assumption is that these experts would be commonly used, and they include everything from paralegals to law students to investigators to mitigation experts, and we're trying to get the word out there that, uh, that these things should be commonly used and um, that these are uh, rates that you shouldn't have to quarrel with, that you shouldn't be uh, shocked by or... Uh, uh, or cut unnecessarily. Um, Dr. Rucker, I would just add that uh, to, to um, these comments that I agree, and also one of the large concern, larger concerns from a national perspective that I have is that um, if the culture uh, is where the experts or investigation is not authorized, uh, this spiraling down to the lowest common denominator is very disturbing, not just in the local or district area, but also nationally, because um, as you know, our percentages in many areas for panel attorneys um, being authorized to hire these experts, including investigators, is, is a, a very low percentage. Shocking to some people. Uh, and what I feel is that we've got to make sure that creative lawyers are, are in supported, endorsed, buoyed up. Um, look at Booker, look at Johnson cases, Ms. Menendez went to the Supreme Court. I mean, people, people have to be um, given the support financially and culturally to challenge, to raise creative motions, to make sure they hire investigators and experts, to make sure that the government, the second principle that I talked about, is held accountable and to the highest standard. And if we don't hire those experts, then what will happen is that we're not asking for the same amount of money each year, and then Congress will say, well, you didn't use it this year, why do you need it, right? So we'll spin down to the lowest denominator, and that's really what I'm worried about. I think we have to make sure that um, we work on training and other issues to bring those numbers up to, and, and there are people on all spectrums who believe in a zealous adversarial criminal justice process, uh, including Senator Grassley and staff and others about the, the, the lack of trials, perhaps, it is one um, term I've heard um, from all political spectrums. So I hope that we can train more. We do need more resources for training, but I also think it's a cultural barrier that we've really all got to pull together to try to overcome. Great. Thank you, Judge Carter. Mr. Rowe. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Clark, I, I think that's accurate that there are, that 
people from every aspect of the system believe that there should be a Sixth Amendment right and it should be zealous advocacy intellectually. The question is, is do they want to pay for it? And that's what I want to talk about a little bit. Uh, Judge Blake, I want to talk about the, the memo that you issued with Judge Bates back in, I think it was Dece December 23, was it 2014? Mm -hmm. Okay. And essentially, as I recall, the purpose of that memo was that there were judges, or you were certainly receiving information, that there were judges all over the country who were cutting vouchers because they believed that it was a cost containment issue and in order to save money, cut some of, whether it be 10% or 5% or 20%, whatever it happened to be, cut some of the CJA vouchers and there, were, there would be a cost savings. Is that why the memo, essentially why it was issued? Yes, uh, essentially we were receiving information from uh, panel attorneys from some of the advisory groups um, within the AO uh, that there certainly was at least a, uh, a perception that vouchers were being cut because of the difficult financial times, that there were judges who um, uh, genuinely believed that in a difficult financial time, cutting everybody a bit was the, it was an appropriate way to, to go to help conserve resources. That, of course, is contrary to judicial conference policy uh, and also to the extent that perhaps some judges believed that by cutting a voucher they were saving money for their own court. That is, of course, not correct. It's a national a nationally administered pot of money. So we were hopeful that simply reminding everyone uh, that it is not judicial conference policy, that that is not how you uh, deal with difficult financial times, uh, and having, in, indeed, in addition to the letter, there was a um, frequently asked question section that referred people to uh, conference policy. That, yes, that was the purpose of the letter. Um, it's very hard to evaluate the uh, its success, but we hope it made some difference. And one of the things it said in the memo was that it wasn't just that it was against conference policy, but it also said you should, that the courts should pay for reasonable and necessary services. Mm -hmm. That if the attorney actually invested the time and it was reasonable and necessary, that that should be paid. And cr correct? Yes. I mean, that's I, the policy. I so I don't have the, the, the letter opened up in front of me at the I moment. I can, I can find <laughs> it. <laughs> I think she'll quote you now. <laughs> um, but it says I it mandates fair compensation for appointed counsel by providing in subsection D1 that attorneys shall be compensated for time expended in court or reasonably expended out of court and reimbursed for expenses reasonably incurred. Providing fair compensation to appointed counsel then is a critical component of the administration, administration of justice in our federal courts. Uh, yeah, I have found the letter. I'm sure you were quoting it accurately. Yes. First paragraph. All right. and the reason I ask that is because I, or the reason I mentioned, I, I should say, is because I think that some of the issue that we're dealing with is a philosophical one. That there are judges who have this uh, authority, obviously, to appoint counsel, determine what is an appropriate amount to pay counsel, determine whether or not the voucher should be paid. And some of those judges believe, in uh, a good faith belief, that this process or this service is pro bono. And that, yes, the idea is to take, a, take away some of the sting of providing this service so it won't be so expensive for an attorney to do it. But th this is a public service and everyone must uh, participate in this if they're going to be a, a good officer of the court, a good member of the bar. And when we talk about voucher cuts and trying to educate the, the judges and sending them memos like this, and whether or not education is sufficient, the question I keep coming back to is, what about the folks, just like you folks, get to make these decisions, just like the folks we've seen all over the country, the judges who get to make the decision, what about the folks who honestly believe that the attorney should not be fully compensated? They still believe in intellectually that folks have a right to counsel and equal justice under the law, 
but they also believe that the attorneys who provide the services shouldn't be fully compensated. And so if we don't have some kind of a structure, if we just make recommendations, as people have made, I think um, Judge Prado made 20-some uh, years ago, as the Judicial Conference has made, as recently as a year ago, you and the head of the AO, or two years ago, I can't remember what the date is, 2013, 2014, so a year, just a little, a year and a half ago, recommendations, the same recommendations over and over, and yet we go all over this country and we hear from attorneys that their vouchers just get cut, and the judges say, well, there's a certain amount of public service here. So how do we fix that if it's all we do is recommend? Well, I think what you're asking is whether there needs to be a structural change. And again, ideally, and only speaking from my personal opinion, I'm not sure what the ultimate answer is. But yes, if you want to completely eliminate the possibility of an Article III judge um, in, with the best of intentions taking a different attitude about how vouchers should be paid, I suppose you have to remove it from the authority of the judge. Short of that, I can only say again that education, judicial conference policy, um, guidelines, trying to be careful about how one develops a program like e-voucher, making it as difficult as possible to go outside um, uh, of what the guidelines are, uh, maybe uh, maybe the best that we that we can do. I think it's important to focus on, again, we've talked about this before, parity with the prosecution, for example. We do not think generally of the prosecution as a pro bono service. It may be public service in a larger sense, and some of us may think that any government work is public service in a larger sense, but it is not pro bono. It is something that the attorney deserves to be fully compensated for and the client deserves to be able to attract a cadre of lawyers that are fully qualified. And in our society today, I certainly would not argue with you that full pay, rather than some reduction in pay, is critical to getting that good representation. And I think it's clear from, and I'm sure you've done this reading as well as I have and members of the committee, but I think it's clear from the legislative history from the Criminal Justice Act that there certainly was a pro bono aspect of this, but the pro bono aspect was the rate. Exactly. That that's what was supposed to be pro bono, right. not after you determine the rate and put in that service, then we cut you 20% or 50% or whatever it happens to be. Well, and at this point, I mean, I'm not sure that I would actually even agree with you that the rate should be pro bono. I, I, I agree we are not suggesting that panel attorneys or federal defenders for that matter go into this to make as much money as they could in private practice. Clearly, they can make more money in private practice, and our survey showed that for, for panel attorneys. But I think even so, so that you are starting with the idea that we will not pay that rate, but it needs to be enough. It needs to be, it needs to be enough. It needs to provide parity, again, with the, uh, the government resources that are lined up on the other side. It needs to be fair, and it needs to be predictable and not cut arbitrarily, whatever that rate may be. And I think it should be higher, as I've already said, uh, but it should not be cut. Can I, can sure, I just insert something as part of this discussion? It is, um, it, there's indications to us that between 90 to 95 percent of the defendants in the federal system are getting court-appointed lawyers. Yes. And given the uh, complexity of, I mean, these mega cases and uh, multi-defendant cases and the criminalization of so many things at the federal level, is it realistic to even talk about pro bono? I mean, uh, should we be looking at attorneys that are somehow, I mean, I certainly understand public service and uh, the component of public service in, in these rates. But should we be talking about attorneys doing these complex cases with thousands and thousands of documents at a, at, for, for, for at a pro bono, as a pro bono service to the government? Is that realistic? I, again, I, I don't agree with the word pro bono at all. I, I, I mean, I, I think I understood Ms. Rowe's point that if there's anything pro bono about it, you're starting with a reduced rate. So let's, let's not cut it even below that. But 
No, I think the concept should be well-qualified representation, sufficient to meet the resources of the government to deal with these complex cases, as, as you've said. And complexity comes in many, many shapes and forms. It may not only be the multi-defendant, multi-document case. People are dealing with complex mental health problems. They're dealing with folks that English is not their first language. They're uh, young folks that find themselves caught up in a system that's completely different from the state system uh, they were used to. It requires <coughs> building of trust. It requires a great deal of skill in, in many areas that, you know, we should be looking for just good, well-qualified people that are willing to do this and, and dedicate this in, in that larger sense of public service, but I don't think we should be considering it as pro bono uh, at all. Judge Feldman, I, I wanted to ask you a question about the the expert rates. From what I can tell, at least uh, I was a member of DSAG at the time that that was evolving, and from what I can tell from your remarks, I think it was intended to be um, constructive and hopeful it, that it might encourage the CJA attorneys being able to successfully use more experts. But unfortunately, um, one of the things, and not necessarily as a result of this, but one of the things that we're hearing and that we know now is that a number of CJA attorneys, a lot of CJA attorneys, choose not to use expert witnesses or not to request expert services because that's considered part of the cost of the case. And that if they drive up the cost of the case, whether it be psychological or for an interpreter, we, we were places where people would hire their own interpreters and pay it out of their pocket because they didn't want to drive up the cost of the case, because then they would be seen as someone who needed $10,000 to do a certain kind of case when someone else could do it for seven. Um, we're seeing the same thing with psychologists and psychiatrists, that folks choose not to use those services because that drives up the cost of the case. And you would like to believe that that's just something they're concerned about and it's not really an issue, but that's not, I think, really what we're seeing is that it is an issue. The judges do see that as part of the cost of the case. How do we deal with that issue um, with only a recommendation? I mean, yes, this was well-intentioned, but if these folks try to use these services, then even with the well-intentioned ability to do that, now they have harmed themselves. Well, the way you phrase your question, uh, the answer is obvious. You can't do it just with a recommendation. As much as you try, you're, you're, you're dealing with, in some districts, uh, particularly with uh, judges who have some criminal defense background, they know it's not driving, off the, driving up the cost of the case. They know it's driving up the effectiveness of the representation. But you don't have that across the board. I think you have to take, just as you're taking voucher review away from judges, I think you have to take expert costs away from judges. I think. Um, you know, there was some discussion today at lunch about that. You know, I, I'm in the best position to know whether you need this expert or not. Well, I, I disagree with that. I think taking that away from judges and putting it in the hands of someone who understands the criminal defense function and the need for an expert and having that um, justified to that individual as opposed to the presiding judge is a policy or a rule or a statute or what, however you do it that has to be done because um, the fundamental principle that I think is the premise of your question, is the use of an expert is not to drive up the cost of the case, it's to provide due process and the best representation to the defendant. And where you don't have that, you have a real problem in structure. Thank you. Um, Mr. Clark, I have a, a question about what you said about wanting to be more, more proactive. You were talking about the fact that you would give your opinions or your thoughts to the folks um, at the AO who were writing a policy or taking a position, and essentially if it was inconsistent with the judicial, what well, benefited the judiciary the most, I guess if we could put it that way, or what the judicial position was, then it gets left on the cutting room floor. And you said you dreamed of being more proactive. If you could be proact more proactive, what would that dream look like? So, Ms. Rowe, you're putting me on the spot because um, That's why uh, I'm here. I know you are uh, asking a question which I think, um, I hope the committee will, will certainly come to some conclusions about structure, but I do think uh, if you looked again at the prosecu prosecutors in the, in the Department of Justice, they have a government relations division, they have an access to justice office, they look at reentry, they, they, they identified 
people in every office to be re-entry coordinators. Those are the type of things that I think we should be doing. We should be working on prisoner re-entry, ensuring that we, we have the defense voice at the policy-making table. Um, and I have the utmost respect for our, um, our Legislative Affairs Office, and they will often help me, remind me that it's judicial conference policy that, of course, sets our direction. And we could do that. I do believe that if we start the process within the Legal Policy Division with the Defender Services Committee giving us the nod, we could actually be proactive, but it takes a long time. It goes through a lot of uh, agenda item rewrites and processes uh, to get to the judicial conference, and it could be perhaps too late in some ways. Um, I think that both Judge Feldman and Judge Blake used a very important word, which is flexibility. And um, as you know, criminal justice reform is on the agenda on Capitol Hill and throughout this country. I, and I firmly believe that the public defense voice is underrepresented. And it has to be uh, much more of a, a, a stronger, uh, more proactive voice in um, new initiatives. And I would say, when I say the cutting room floor, it's done with grace and respect. It's just that our, our opinions, um, I often you, will Does that make you feel better? <laughs> no. <laughs> the Legal Policy Division will be very good about saving those documents and using those for perhaps training or working with other divisions to make sure that that, that position doesn't get lost. But I mean, I think you and others know that when immigration reform came forward, there would be different viewpoints in that area in particular. So um, having a government relations division would be ideal, just like the prosecutors do. Um, if I would just add one other note, when you were talking about pro bono, it would be wonderful to see if the prosecutors do any pro bono when they take on one of these major cases. And, and if the vouchers are cut, maybe there could be an, a study of what uh, the equivalent would be. If we're talking about an adversarial process, I really do think we need to look at the Department of Justice and the structures therein. I'm Thank gonna, you. I, I'm gonna, um, we're, we're running a little behind, but, um, and so we're gonna start the next panel that was supposed to start at 2.45. We'll start at about five to three, but I just wanna make sure if there's anybody. Can I on, just ask a follow up to yes. th just this last and I And I would ask as you respond, try to keep it brief, because I do want any committee member who has an important question. To I, I, I did wanna ask a follow up, okay, uh, Ms. Clark, to the uh, structural question, because uh, you were talking about initiatives such as compassionate release or prison reentry that, that you would like uh, to, to see, and there are certain strictures or tight ropes that you're walking. I mean, is it enough to have a government relations division? I mean, is it something that should be outside of the AO or outside of the judiciary to truly be able to do that? I mean, when you're talking about compassionate release, you've got weeks or maybe months, you don't have time to rewrite memos. Um, and I'm, I'm not talking about you, but I'm talking about going through the judicial conference. So uh, talk to us just briefly about structure, right? What, what are the strictures? What are the tight ropes that you have to walk? And, and would they be resolved by just having a governmental relations division? Um, I, I think the strictures are, are very clear. It, we follow judicial conference policy, right. full stop. Uh, the Defender Services Committee sets uh, the direction for the Defender Services Office, full stop. Is it enough to have a government relations office only? No. Okay, that's my question, because I mean, yeah. All right, that answers. Anybody else? Can I ask a couple of, I'd like to ask a couple of questions. First, for Ms. Clark, um, could you, and I know you weren't there in, uh, for very long before DSO was demoted to its current position, so without even reference to what it used to be, could you talk a little bit about the specific authorities that would make it easier for you to do your job as you would like to do it that you don't have, putting aside the legislative part that we've talked about? Well, uh, Mr. Khan, I would say one is that we are, um, we spend a great deal of time having our work reviewed and um, there's benefit to that uh, in that there's caution. I, on my way up here, I read uh, George Washington's farewell address, and he talks about that the administrators of government must be very cautious. 
And I agree that there's a, a certain amount of caution, but I think what I've noticed with some of the reorg, um, the impact is, and, and the removal of, of uh, the jurisdiction, that, that has had a huge, and the removal of our IT division. Those, those issues have made it um, more difficult, I think, to be efficient. Um, I would just, I, I suppose I would add one other piece, which is that um, the Def Department of Program Services is, I think, the guts of the AO because it has judicial services, court services, uh, data, and analysis. But our, our work is, is different, and um, we, de we, the defense function, are different. And I think you know that and others, that our data has to be very carefully vetted. We have to make sure before we release anything that it is, uh, that we have a good grasp of it. I, I fear that with the development of the, um, or the, I guess as you said, the restructuring, that we're, we're not as, um, as the buck stops here <laughs> in control of the data uh, and making sure that we are proactively thinking about what you're gonna need for the future. Because you're absolutely right, Ms. Rowe, it's, the, it's a, a, a goal to have the highest quality representation. The question is, will people pay for it? I think they'll pay for it if we have the data, we have the stories, we have the strength to tell those stories. And, and right now, the structure is that with the IT division elsewhere and, and with the judicial conference having removed jurisdiction and the work measurement formulas and a lot of the processes that we go through, I'm not sure we're being the most efficient that we could be. And I would really like us to be efficient and flexible. Thank you. Judge Blake, I had one question for you, which is that you talked about restoring DSC's prior authority uh, over staffing and compensation, but one authority that DSC always lacked was uh, ultimate budget authority, the opportunity to determine and advocate for the funds that it believed were needed and appropriate to run this program. Is any solution that doesn't include that authority <laughs> adequate? <coughs> well, I guess I would disagree with you to some extent. I think that we do have the authority to develop and advocate for a budget that we think fully serves defenders' needs. You are quite right that we do not always <coughs> prevail uh, in persuading um, other members of the judiciary who have the ultimate decision-making power uh, to adopt everything that we recommend. I do think we have some influence. I do think our voice is heard. We do have that responsibility, at least initially, to ask for what we think we need, and I think our committee uh, does that. Uh, ideally, um, could we still remain within the judiciary but have a bit more of an independent voice of the Defender Services Committee in advocating for what we think we need? I would like to see the committee um, explore that. Thank you. Okay. Anybody up there? Professor Poole, any questions? Just one quickly. Um, Judge Feldman, I want to go back and just make sure I understand something when you were talking about the DSBS and the mega cases. You were saying that you review the budgets in those cases, correct? Yes. Um, as you think about the budgets that you, your uh, subcommittee has reviewed, how often does the committee return a budget because they think that the defendant or the defender or the, the sorry, the panel attorney has not asked for enough? Uh, I can't think of a situation where they where we've told them they haven't asked for enough. I think what we've sometimes said is let's um, <coughs> divide it up into segments. Um, for example, on a habeas case, pre-petition investigation, and then do another budget. We do it in segments, but um, I don't think we've said to them they haven't asked for enough. Okay, so bear with me on a moment on this because I want to see what your your response would be. So we've heard the committee's heard testimony that not enough lawyers are asking for service providers. Well, not enough CJA panel okay, attorneys. Okay, are asking for them. Um, and you're saying that these budgets are not being returned for want of okay, enough. Just so you understand, because you're kind of mixing out. Okay, that's what, I was, yeah, that's what I thought. The Defender Services Budget Subcommittee 
does the mega cases for federal defenders. Okay, that's okay. what I wanted to know. And so that that if clarifies have, it. If you have a mega case, with a net, you have to go in front of the presiding judge, which presents its own okay. set of issues. All right. Okay. That's all I needed to know. Thanks. All right. Anything else? All right. Thank you very much. We appreciate your commentary. Let me say, as we go forward and we uh, gather the info and we begin to make some decisions, we may get back in touch with you if we need a follow-up. If you feel you need to give us any follow-up, please feel free to do that. But we want, on behalf of the entire committee, I want to thank all of you. We're going to take a short break so we can get started. So we have five minutes, and I'd ask everybody on the next panel to get in. Get ready. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.